Hallelujah. Oh, I like the way Pastor Eugene says it. Lee! That's a great surname. Praise God. Hallelujah. Are you happy to be in the house of God? If you are, go ahead and make a joyful noise. Praise the Lord. And once again, a very warm welcome to our friends and uh, family members who are here with us this morning. You are our visitors. You are here because uh, someone you know is getting baptized. We want to warmly welcome you. Why don't we just bow forward our prayers? We prepare ourselves to listen to the Word of God. Father, we just want to thank you for just that great sense of your presence and love in this place this morning. We can sense your love just moving in this church, just moving in our hearts during our time of worship. And we pray that as we come to this moment where we listen to your word, Holy Spirit, we welcome you to come and speak to us, to come and open our hearts so that more than just knowledge, we will have uh, just our hearts open to you and receiving something that is so deep that will change our lives this morning. We thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say, Amen, Amen. You know, we really, really started the year 2019 in like such a tremendous way. And, and we have heard an important message right at the start of the year about hungering for God, right? And the key message about hungering for God is the fact that we must not settle down. We must not settle in in our walk with the Lord. Can you turn to your friend and say to them, don't settle in. Don't settle in. And you know, I learned one powerful prayer to pray early in my Christian life. And this prayer, and I think this prayer every Christian must learn to pray, consists of only two words. And these two words are, more Lord, more Lord. Everybody say, more Lord. We want more of God, amen? We want more of His presence, amen? We want more of His love in our lives, amen? And, and it's indeed true that as we hunger and as we thirst and as we desire for more of God, He will pour forth more of His presence, more of His glory into our lives and into our church. And I, and I know that this is true because God has even given to our church a promise from His Word. When this church was started, the Lord gave us this promise in Haggai 2.9 that tells us the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. And indeed, there's going to be more of God's glory. There's going to be more of God's presence. There's going to be more of God's great works among us. Amen? And, and there's indeed going to be more. And as I look at this verse, as I look at this promise that the Lord has given to us, and, and the Lord tells us, hey, you do your part. You be hungry. You don't settle in. You will see more. And as I think about this, there's this stirring in my heart that, that says to the Lord, Lord, yes, I want to see more of you. And, and, and specifically in the area of my own worship life, in the area of my own devotional life, in the area of the worship life of my G12 group or my cell group, I say, God, I want to see more of your presence. And even in our worship life together right here in church, I say, God, we want to see more of your presence that will come and fill us whenever we worship, that will come and just uh, kind of overcome us with, with your love in such a deep way. And we want more of you, Lord, in, 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 in our lives, in our personal lives, whenever we meet, whenever we worship, because we want people to come to know you. We want people to walk right into church and they can sense the very presence of God, whether they are Christians or, or they have not yet received the Lord. We want to see the, the lives of our friends being touched by the Lord. And there's this stirring in my heart. There's this hunger in my heart, even as we begin this year talking about hungering, talking about not settling in. And as I think about what, what, what to preach about this weekend, I just sense that, hey, I need to, I need to talk about worship. I need to talk about worshipping the Lord. I need to talk about coming back to worship. And you know, I believe that God's presence, God's glory, which is the manifestation of His presence, will be poured out greater and greater when we grow in the depth and the quality of our worship life. John Piper made this statement that many of us in church, we have heard about or read about. He says this, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. In other words, when we find our 
deep satisfaction. When, our, when we find our deep delight in being satisfied, in worshipping God, in drawing close to His presence, we will see God just pouring out His glory and His presence greater and greater upon our lives. Amen. And we know that when God's glory is here, we know that when God's presence is here, we will receive blessings and, 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 and blessings that will touch our life, blessings that will meet the needs of our life. And I want to say this to our friends here who have not received Jesus Christ. I want to say this to you. God loves you. And He wants to meet the needs of your life as well. Just like we have seen in the video earlier on, on our, about our brother Simon, God reaching out to touch him with his presence. And so this weekend's sermon is birthed out of this stirring, is birthed out of this desire in my heart as I thought about what should we, what is God's word for us this weekend. And therefore, this weekend's sermon is entitled Cultivate Heart of Worship. Cultivate Heart of Worship. And we're going to read the key uh, passage for us uh, this morning. And this message I preached about two weeks back ago at a youth service. Uh, and that was, uh, uh, in fact, that, yeah, that was last week. And, and before, and I was preaching it in the afternoon. And at night, when Pastor Wee Long preached, he used the same key passage. And I, and I felt such a confirmation, such an affirmation of God's word for us. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 22, verses 35 to 39, which is our key verses for this morning. All right? And if you do not have your Bibles with you, you can look to the screen. And the Word of God tells us, One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest command, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, when we talk about the whole aspect of, of worship, sometimes this, this, this word worship tends to be misunderstood. We think of worship as something religious that we do in church. We think of worship as maybe prayer. We think of worship maybe as some form of rituals that we go through meaninglessly without really understanding what it's all about. Some of us think of worship, especially the younger generations, that worship is all about songs and what we load in into our Spotify, what's the worship song list, you know. And, and unfortunately, even in, in, in our Christian lives, in the Christian world today, a lot of people think about worship in terms of the products of worship and there are lots of so-called products of worship out there. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, these are great things that help us, that aid us in our worship life, in our worship time, whether is it songs, whether is it music, whether is it some forms or expressions of worship, but worship is much, much more than all these things. Worship is much, much more than this, all these things. And if we were to ask ourselves, when we talk about cultivating and, and the heart of worship, what do we really mean by the heart of worship? What do we really mean by the heart of worship? And I really like this definition given by the Desiring God Ministries. And, and this is what is written there. It says this, The heart of worship is our heart. The heart of worship is our heart. Delighting in Jesus and expressing praise to Him. He is at the center. He is the focus. It is His commands we consider first not our preferences. The heart of worship is our heart. It's all about Jesus. It's not about the products of worship. It's not about just what we do in worship. It is all about our heart. And therefore, to understand or to walk in true worship that's pleasing to God, we need to come back to what is really upon the heart of God concerning worship. What is the heart of worship? And we want to turn our attention to what Jesus tells us about worship. Not just what we read about worship, not just what we like to hear in terms of songs about worship, not just what we want to load into our Spotify playlist about worship. We want to come and learn from Jesus. What is the heart of worship? How do we cultivate the heart of worship? And, and this morning, we want to answer this question. How do we cultivate 
a heart of true worship. How do we cultivate a heart of true worship? Can you help me tell your friend and say to them, God wants you to have a heart of true worship. Okay? God wants you to have a heart of true worship. And for some of our friends here, you, 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 are, you are a visitor, you are not yet a believer, you know, I want to encourage you to open your heart and your mind to understand, hey, when, when, when Christians talk about worship, uh, what do they mean? You know, what, what's the difference between the way Christians think about worship uh, versus uh, other faiths? And, and I want you to encourage you to open your heart as, as, we, as we hear this word about the heart of worship. So we want to answer this question, how do we cultivate the heart of worship? To cultivate a heart of worship, brothers and sisters, we need to first live out the passion of worship through extravagant love. To cultivate a heart of true worship, we need to first live out the passion of worship through extravagant love. And in the verse that we just read, Jesus says this in Matthew twenty two thirty seven: Love, love, Love the Lord your God. And if we were to strip away all the forms and all the sophistications and all the products, so to speak, of worship, if we were just to, just to strip all these things away, the heart of worship is really about our heart loving Jesus. It is not rituals. It is not a set of rules and regulations that we go through primarily. It is not just the form of it. The heart of worship is all about our hearts loving Jesus. It is all about a loving relationship. That is the heart of worship. That is the very core of worship. The passion of worship is extravagant love. And what we need to understand friends, brothers and sisters, is that we, when we talk about the heart of worship, we need to come back to understanding that God who created us is the one who initiates this invitation and He calls us and He created us and He says, hey, I created you. Men and women, I created you. And I created you for a very important purpose. And that purpose is that you may bring me pleasure that purpose is that you may bring me love. That purpose is that you may respond to me in love, in extravagant love and pleasure and, and bring me pleasure through your love. In Revelation 4 verse 11, it says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they were created. And when you think about this, you know, when you look at this verse, it talks about God being a great God. God being the creator of heaven and earth. He's worthy. He's glorious. He is just magnificent in so many, many ways. Yet this great God who has just legions and, 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 and countless of angels surrounding His throne. Yet this great God reaches out to us and says, Hey, you, you, you and you and I, all of us individually as His children, all of us uniquely as His creation, He gives to us this invitation and He says, Hey, I want you to bring me pleasure. I want you to bring me delight. I want you to respond to me in worship through your extravagant love. And that is an incredible thought that the God of heaven and earth who has all the angels that He could ever ask for in heaven that will bow to Him and worship, and they do. And, and, and despite that, God calls you and I to a place where we can enjoy Him and let Him enjoy us. And that is the passion, the passion of what God calls us to do in worship, to give to Him our extravagant love. So you see, brothers and sisters, friends, 
God wants us to love Him back. He wants you and I to bring pleasure back to Him through our extravagant love and worship. And it's an incredible thought. It's an incredible thought. God doesn't have to. God doesn't need to. But God extends His love towards us and says, Hey, you are my children. I created you. You are unique. I give to you this privilege. I give to you this honour to come and to, and, to, and to give back to me pleasure through your extravagant love and worship. You know, when we think about this whole aspect of worship being our extravagant love for the Lord, the truth of the matter is in our human selfish self, we are not capable of the extravagant love, right? We are not able to give to God that kind of extravagant love that He first gave to us. And, and we, we can't in ourselves. But I realize an important truth. And the truth is this. We are able to give to God the extravagant love when we first understand how extravagantly He has given His love first to us. Amen? How extravagantly He has poured out His love towards us. And that is why the Bible tells us in 1 John 3, 1, See what great love the Father has lavished on us. Everybody say lavish. Come on, say lavish in a lavish way. Lavish. That we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. Now listen to me carefully. Worship is giving to God the passion of, of extravagant love. Listen, how do, we, how do we find that within ourselves to then give to God that? Listen to me carefully. We are able to give to God passionate, extravagant love because Jesus has first given of His passionate love for you and I. In fact, I will even go on to say this. Do you know that you and I are the passion of Jesus? You and I are the ones that Jesus came for and He focused on and He died for. You and I are the passion of Jesus. We are the subject of His extravagant love. That is why He came. He came for you. And when you understand like what we watch in the movie, The Passion of Christ, when you understand that we are the passion of Christ, we are the one that He first reached out to, then would we understand that, wow, in receiving that love that first comes from Him, we are able to return it back to Him. Amen? And that God really, really loves us extravagantly. He really, really lavishes His love over and over upon us our lives. And this thought just gripped me this morning as I was just praying and thinking about it. We are the passion of Christ. We are the passion of Jesus. That is why He came from heaven to first reach out to us. The God whom we worship, He does not sit up there way up in heaven and say, hey, come, come, you come up. Oh, why, is, why are you so down below. Come up, come up, come up to my level. Come up and worship me. Can't you see I'm so great? No, 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 no. That is not how he, he does it. The God of heaven first came down for us. He came down to walk among us. He came down to show us His extravagant love. He came down to show us that we are the passion of His heart. And in doing that, in sacrificing Himself for us, he draws us to a place of worship. Come on, go ahead and give Jesus a big clap of praise. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I remember, you know, all these are, are truths, but I remember that there's, some, there's something that happened in my life that really, really changed my understanding when I talk about God's lavish and extravagant love for me. And, and I was teaching in an encounter weekend, which we call Life Class 3, some many years ago, and I was the trainer. And I remember in that session, uh, as we go through the Life Class or the Encounter Weekend, there's this session when we talk about seeing Jesus on the cross or, or, or the cross of Jesus Christ. And I, I remember I was just 
speaking and ministering and praying. And as I closed my eyes, I suddenly saw a picture of Jesus. You know, he was just hanging on the cross and, 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 and we have seen different pictures or even the movie about it, The Passion of the Christ. And Jesus was just hanging there. And suddenly I had this, I, I zoom in and I, and I saw the, the Lord just bleeding. And he was bleeding from his head because there were a crown of thorns placed over, his, over him. He was bleeding from his hands because his hands were pierced with nails. He was bleeding from his feet and because they were Years and he was just bleeding. He was whipped 39 times. He was just bleeding and bleeding. And, and I found myself just, just in that kind of sadness. And I, and I said to God, God, you know, why? Why must Jesus bleed so much? Why must Jesus shed so much blood? It's, why does he need to keep bleeding so much? And, and as if it was not enough, according to the Bible account, and I saw that in my mind, the Bible tells us a Roman soldier took a spear as if it was not enough that Jesus was already bleeding from every part of his body. As if it was not enough, the Roman soldier took a spear and pierced the very side of Jesus. And the Bible records for us as the Roman soldier pierced right through the very side of Jesus, rupturing even his heart. Water and blood just gush out and gush out and it was kind of like the, the, the blood was totally and completely drained from the body of Jesus Christ. And when I saw that in my, in my mind, my mental picture in my mind, I just, I just started to cry. I just started to weep. And I said, God, why must every drop of blood be shed from your son? Why must it be drained out from your son? And in that moment, I realized that every drop of blood from the body of Jesus Christ was drained to show how much and how extravagant and how lavish our God is in just letting His Son shed blood completely so that He can save us from our sins. And every drop of the blood of Jesus needed to be drained because the sins of this world, the sins of mankind, my sins are so terrible. We, in, 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 in ourselves, we can never get rid of this sin, but only through the blood of Jesus, every drop being drained, can our sins, past, present, and future, be cleansed. And from that point onwards, what I understood in my mind, I now understand in my heart forever that if I ever doubt, if I ever doubt that God lavishly and extravagantly loved me, I come back to that picture and, and say to God, God, show me the cross. And when I see the cross where every drop of blood was shed from my Saviour's physical body, it is like the evidence of His lavish love for us. Amen. Come on, go ahead and give Jesus a big clap of praise. Wow. <laughs> Hallelujah. We are His passion. We are first His passion. We are first the objects of His extravagant love. And it is what He has first poured out for us that He calls us to then come and give back to Him that worship in that same extravagant love that is poured back to Him. And what we pour back to Him is but first what He has first poured out to us extravagantly, extravagantly. And you know, we need to understand this truth. God doesn't call us to come up to my level, I'm God, come and worship me. He doesn't do that. And, and not only that, God would never, because He loves us, He would never force us to worship Him, okay? You don't believe, why don't you try it, okay? Do you think God will force you to lift up your hands right now if you don't want to lift up your hands in worship? That would be quite scary, right? No, you must worship, zoop. And our hands are suddenly lifted up. He will never force us. He will never force us because forcing us will therefore mean that it is not a worship or it's not a relationship based on love, right? And we can't force our children to love us. We can't force our spouses to love us. God will never force us to worship Him, but He draws us to worship Him because we are His passion. We are the, the, the subjects, the object of His great love. And in return, 
we want to willingly give to Him. We want to willingly give to the Lord our extravagant love and worship. And you know something? It is actually a great privilege when you think about it, that the God of heaven and earth, He could have, and He has all of creation to worship Him. He has all the angels in heaven to worship Him, yet He calls us individually to come to Him. He calls us as a big family as well to come to Him to worship. It's an, indeed a great privilege. And you know why? And this is what Rick Warren says. He says, to bring enjoyment to God is the first purpose of your life and mine. And listen to this. This proves your worth. You are that important to God. You know this invitation from God to come and worship Him extravagantly with all of our hearts, with our hearts of love, shows us how important we are. Amen. It is like today you get an invitation from the president or from the king you must say, oh, I must be someone very important that I'm being invited. Listen, you are important to God. You're the passion of Jesus Christ. That's why He came to die for you, to shed His life for you. And because you are important, because you are worth something, because you are worth it, He calls you to come and worship Him. He invites you to come into His presence. Amen. I think we should be putting a smile on our faces now. We look so sad, huh? <laughs> we should be smiling from cheek to cheek. We should be smiling from year to year. It is our great privilege that the God of heaven and earth will consider us first His passion and He invites us to passionately, extravagantly love Him. Now, some of us, and I preach this to the young people, one of the questions they ask is that, okay, okay, I will give to God extravagant love. I will, I will worship Him passionately with my heart. But uh, pastor, no need to be expressive, right? I mean, God understands my heart, right? I don't need to be expressive. I don't need to be drama mama, you know. I don't need to do all these things. Well, listen, the Bible says to love the Lord with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our soul, and all our strength. And remember what I showed you earlier on? The heart of worship is our heart. Delighting in Jesus and expressing praise to Him, it is His commands we consider first, not our preferences. It's about what Jesus enjoys. It is about what Jesus loves. And kind of like to make sure that we understand this, there's a record for us in the Bible of a woman's extravagant love. And this woman, the Bible tells us, is an immoral woman. And she, and she came to the home of a religious leader where Jesus was. And this woman came to the home of a religious leader and, and it was a cultural big no-no of, of their time. It was a religious no-no for a sinful woman to step into the house of a religious leader and, and, and what more to interact with the men there. And the Bible tells us that this woman, when she saw Jesus, when she saw the love of Jesus for her, she came and she fell at the feet of Jesus. She started to cry and, and she shed tears and, and her tears were wet the feet of Jesus so much that that she was able to wipe the feet of Jesus with her hair. She was able to break uh, an expensive jar of perfume and, and, to, and to put perfume on the feet of Jesus. And she kissed and kissed the feet of Jesus. And listen to what Jesus said about what this woman did. Then Jesus turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came to your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, listen, therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. And whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Brothers and sisters, friends, there's only one word to describe this woman. She was extravagant. 
She was extreme. She was unusual. She was unreasonable in the way she expressed her love to Jesus Christ. And you know, when I read this scripture, I realized something quite important. Jesus did not stop this woman and say, hey, hey what you're doing is very, it, it, it's not good for you. No, you are humiliating yourself. Jesus did not stop her, but Jesus allowed her to keep kissing his feet. Jesus allowed her to keep crying and wetting his feet and cleaning his feet and wiping his feet with her hair. And she just kept extravagantly expressing her love to Jesus and she kept loving him, loving him and loving him because she knew that this whom uh, she was wiping, these, uh, these feet of Jesus whom were wiping would be the very feet, would be the very person who will pour out extravagant love for her. One day, someday at the cross, and right in that moment, she sensed God's deep love for her. You know, it is amazing. The Lord did not stop her. When I preached at the youth service, I got Pastor Charmaine and her husband Jasper to act out the scene. And so Jasper was uh, Jesus, and, uh, and Pastor Charmaine was the woman because she had long hair. <laughs> and wow, they really acted, you know, Jasper came and he took off his shoes and then he took out his socks and he threw it at the congregation. Okay, you want to experience that, just come to youth service. You know, and then, and then Pastor Shamin just started to wipe his feet with her hair, you know, and started to kiss his feet, you know, and, and, and wow, it was just an amazing time they were acting. And after that, I asked them. You know, I say, Jasper, Charmaine, how, how do you feel when you're doing that? She said, Pastor, disgusting. <laughs> Husband and wife, she said, disgusting, you know. And I said, then, then why do you do it? Why do you do it? Do you not love him? Pastor, I did it because you are my boss. You told me to do so, right? <laughs> but the point is this. Jesus did not stop this woman, but allow her to extravagantly express her love for him. You know, church, listen. Perhaps some of us, we have been believers for a long time and we have grown sophisticated. We know it all. We know all the songs. We know that it's going to be two fast songs, three slow songs, or three fast songs. Two, so we, we just know all of it and we know the forms. We even occasionally sing some worship songs on our own. But Perhaps there are many of us in church this weekend. We have lost the heart of worship. We have lost that extravagant love. What God demands of us is all of our heart, all of our hearts, all of our love, and all of our love extravagantly. And if we have lost that heart, and, and, and I can tell you for, for a fact that even as a pastor, I have, I have lost that heart of worship in, in many points of my life. We need to come back to extravagantly love the Lord. Amen. And the only way I know how is to come back to the cross where we see afresh His extravagant love for us and experience and encounter afresh His extravagant love for us. And perhaps at the end of worship, many of us need to come forward and just kneel at the feet, at the cross of Jesus and just say, God, I, I open my heart and, and I receive your passionate love for me, Lord so that I can give back to you that worship that pleases you. And that is why I've grown to really, really love the words of this song that says, and you can sing together with me, we don't need the music. It's extravagant, it doesn't make sense, we'll never comprehend. The way you love us is unthinkable. Only heaven knows just how far you go To say you love us To say you love us To say you love us You sound great. Let's sing that again. It's extravagant It never makes sense Just how far we had Say you love us is unthinkable. 
Only heaven knows just how far you go to say you love us, to say you love us, to say you love us. God will go very far. And God has gone very far all the way to the cross to show how much He loves us. And if He ever needs to show you again and to show you again and to show you again and again, He would because He really loves you. And you're the passion of His heart. And for our friends who do not know Jesus, this is the difference of what Christian worship means that we have a God who first reached down to us and He came among us and He walked among us and He suffered the worst kind of death any man could suffer to show and to say to us how much He loves us. And He gives to us this invitation and privilege to worship Him and to love Him. Amen. How do we cultivate a heart of true worship? To cultivate a heart of true worship, we must first live out the passion of worship through extravagant love. Because we have a God who loves us so much. Come on, go ahead and give Jesus a big clap of praise right now. Oh, extravagantly. Come on. Hallelujah. To cultivate a heart of worship, Worship, we must first live out the passion of worship through extravagant love. Number two, we must live out the practice, the practice of worship through extreme submission. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it love your neighbor as yourself. Everybody say with me, Commandment. Say together with me, All. Oh, and you know, when we think about this and when we think about the heart of worship and giving true worship to God, we must realize that beyond the emotional part of it, beyond the, 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 the love part of it, which is so important for that worship to be true, it is essentially a commandment, amen? It is a commandment for us to obey. It is a commandment for us to follow. Our worship towards the Lord it's a non-negotiable commandment and it must be lived out through our total and complete submission to God. Listen, church. Jesus gave His all for us so that we can give our all to Him. Just like how the Lord Jesus came because we were His passion and He extravagantly loved us, what we must remember is this our Lord will never do something or He will never ask us to do something which He has not first done for us. And you know something? When you think about Jesus, He walked in extreme submission. Jesus walked in extreme submission for the will of God the Father. And what is essentially the will of God the Father for Jesus? It is to die on the cross for us. And Jesus was extreme in His submission. He was focused in His submission. He was focused on the cross. He was focused on the extreme submission because we are the subject of His passionate and extravagant love. And He said, I will keep walking towards that cross in extreme submission to God the Father so that I can save the children whom He loves. And the God who calls us to worship Him by displaying, by walking, and by practically showing our, our worship through extreme submission has done that first for us. And that is why in Romans 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, God's great mercy towards us, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. It is your true and proper worship. True worship 
or a heart of true worship, brothers and sisters, must be cultivated through the practice of devotion, dedication, and discipline in all aspects of our life. It's not just about singing in church. It's not just about music in church. It is about all of our life displaying extreme submission through devotion, through discipline, through dedication. Why? Because Jesus, who loves us so much, has first displayed that life of obedience and submission so that our salvation is secured in Him. Amen? And that is what He, he calls of us for our worship to be true, for our worship to be uh, uh, coming from a place of complete dedication. So let's look at some areas of our lives, right? Practical areas of our life, because it's a practice of worship. Practical areas of our lives that we must live in extreme submission that pleases God. Firstly, in the area of our personal devotion. In the area of our personal devotion. And, and the truth of the matter is, in our human nature, we don't really like to spend time with God. In our human nature, we like to watch television. We like to turn on Netflix $13.90 for one month. I don't know how much it is, right? In our human nature, we like to go onto social media. In our human nature, we like to chat with friends. You know why I quote all these examples? Because these are the areas that I struggle with, okay? In our human nature, we do not like to spend time with God. But in the area of personal devotion towards the Lord, we must come to a place of disciplined worship unto the Lord. And, and remember, just interacting with, with a university student, and, and this student was not uh, from our church, but I met him on campus, and he came to me because he was so excited that he was standing next to a pastor in this uh, corporate prayer time. And he came to me and said, oh, yeah, pastor, I need to ask you an important question. And I was like, ah, what does he want to ask me? Uh, yeah, you know, Piao Fan Okay, but I look loving towards him. Yeah, yeah, you know. Uh, and, 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 and I was worried he would ask questions like, hey, you know, pastor, you know, if God is so great, can he make a rock so big that he can't even carry it himself? You know, that kind of question. But he didn't ask me that. He asked me a very simple question. He said, hey, pastor, can you tell me, can you tell me, how can I be consistent? How can I be consistent to please God in my personal devotion? And I said, hey, this young man is, is great, you know, asking such an important question. And, 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 and well, the truth be told, there's a lot that we can teach about personal devotion, right? And I didn't, we just had a few minutes. I didn't know how much to download on him. But I found myself asking him, a question, you know, um, because I'm beginning to be like a wise old man. And I turn and look at him and say, hey, can you tell me something? Uh, do you do your devotion or do you spend time in your devotion with God uh, the, 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 as the first most important thing in your life every day or do you do it like uh, end of the day when you have finished with everything? And he say, pastor, how come you know? How come, how come you ask me this question? Of course, I'm a pastor, right? And, uh, and, and he said, Actually, I, I do my devotion right at the end of the day, okay? And I say, then, it is, then you have the answer already, okay? If we make the Lord or we make spending time in worship and devotion before the Lord as our least priority, right? Then it is no wonder that you can't give it all to the Lord. You, you, you can't give true, dedicated, disciplined devotion to the Lord. And I say, make it your most important uh, thing that you do in the day when you're in your best energy. Now, listen to me. I know what some of you are thinking. Huh? Does it mean it must be in the morning? But you know, Pastor, I'm the most energized at night. And how many of you are like that? Okay, don't raise your hand. Huh? But I know many of you are like that. I'm not talking about what is the time of the day. I'm talking about the principle here. The principle here is this. If someone is the most important person in our life, then we will give to him or her the best moments of our life, the best times of our life, the, the highest priority in, in our lives to worship, worship this person or spend time with this person or to love this person, agreed? And so in the area of our personal devotion, we need to spend time. We need to give the Lord the best time in discipline, in submission, and spending time with Him. And we need to come to a place of just loving to spend time with the Lord. And, and you know, I know this is a very simple truth for, for us in church, but 
But there are, there are some of us, we actually have, have our devotional altar. Our devotional time is broken down already. It's like haphazard. We are not consistent, etc. Well, the Lord says to you, return to true worship. Return to worship that pleases me. Cultivate that discipline in your devotion. So, in the area of extreme submission, personal devotion, then extreme submission can be seen when we gather together in worship, in our corporate Worship when we come together to worship the Lord. And when we come together to worship the Lord, whether here in this setting, whether here or whether in our cell group meetings uh, where we have worship, we, we need to come with the attitude that says we're going to come and make God feel He's the most important person in our lives. So coming on time, having the right attitude, getting ourselves ready for that time of worship is so important. I remember that you know, the first time I stepped into an FCBC service, it was not in this auditorium, it was in another auditorium. The first time I stepped into an FCBC service, I, I was just so awed by that atmosphere. It was just supercharged. The people were just so consumed in, in their worship. They were lifting their hands. There were people dancing. People were crying in God's presence and they were just all worshipping the Lord. And I said, wow, what's happening here in this church? And, and later on when I joined the church, I learned two important values. And I can remember it, can remember it even right up to today. Two important values, you know, concerning worship as, as a believer, as, as someone in this church. And these, and, the, and, and these are the two important values. Firstly, we don't worship God our way. We worship God the way He likes us to worship Him. That was the first value I learned in this church when I first joined this church. The second value I learned is this. Our physical postures in worship reflects the attitude and the priority of our hearts. So when we lift up our hands, it's showing that we're surrendering to God. When we kneel uh, uh, on our knees, it's like we are, our hearts are just coming to a posture of humility, coming to a posture of submission. And, and these are two important values that I learned. And you know, when you Take a look at a, a scan of the Bible. You just take a scan of the Bible. Do you know there are at least 21 expressions or forms of worship given to us in the Bible? And we want to worship God the way God likes to be worshipped, not our preferences. So let me just go through with you these 21 expressions of worship, okay? The Bible tells us to use the voice. The Bible tells us to lift up a shout. The Bible tells us to lift up a shout. The Bible tells us to lift up a shout. Now you're awake. The Bible tells us to make a loud noise. The Bible tells us to, to lift our hands, to clap. Wow, very obedient citizens. The Bible tells us to dance. Nobody likes to do anything now. And when it comes to dancing, I need to tell you this story. You know, so I, when I joined this church, oh, lifting hands and, and, and shouting and singing, no problem. But when it comes to dancing, it was a no for me, okay? It was, I was self-conscious about dancing. The, 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 the root issue was self-conscious. I said, I will not dance. I will not jump for the, my own safety and the safety of others. I will not do it, okay? I will not dance. And God, I got no problem. But you know... Worship God the way He likes to be worshipped, not our preferences. And I say, I will never dance. But, but I wanted to obey God. I wanted to, to please the Lord. And I said, God, then please help me. You know, if, uh, if, you, if dancing is what you really like, then help me. Get angels to lift me up, you know, to dance before you. And, and many, many years ago, I, I was also involved in uh, leading worship. And I remember at one... Um, of those times of leading in worship, you know, I said, God, ah, I don't care. I'm going, to, I'm going to dance. I'm going to jump. And I started to jump. And, 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 the truth, and it's really true. When I started to jump and started to, to dance, I, I can't do the ballet style yet, but I just jumped before the Lord. Even just now, the few of us were just jumping up and down. I was suddenly set free from that self-consciousness. I was suddenly free in my heart, in my spirit, through that posture, and the Lord just set me free, you know. And... And I realized an important truth that day, okay? Number one, don't worry about what people are thinking about you because people are not thinking about you. They're thinking about the Lord, you know? And number two, 
hey, dancing really brings a freedom, you know, and, and it was like God just removed that self-consciousness and I went to a new level of worship and loving God. And, 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 and just to make sure, you know, God make sure that the fleshly part of me was gotten rid of, uh, one, one day after I led worship and I was jumping and dancing, a church member came up to me and said, hey, Pastor Roland, that was a great worship that you led. And I said, yeah, tell me more, right? And, and this person went like, wow, I just really love the way you were dancing before God. Oh, yeah, tell me more. Why, you know? And, uh, and this person said, I really love the way you jump on stage. You know, you're like a big ball bouncing up and down. <laughs> and it was like my ego went, the big ball got deflated, you know. And, and I wanted to say, I'm going to bounce and crush you, you know. And, <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, I'm, I was set free, okay. So the postures of our worship, and maybe some of you, you are very conscious about lifting up your hands, you know. Uh, you know, some of us, and the young people in our church, they lift their hands, like, come on, let's lift our hands. So I say, hey, why your hand fracture? <laughs> okay, cannot lift up higher. So if you just lift your hands like that, maybe God just let you function like that, and, you know, cannot lift up anymore. Then how? Okay, and you know, we, we dance, and, and, and they are, they are, just go through quickly the list, processions, uh, which are marches, uh, worship marches, twirling, leaping, standing, bowing and kneeling, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing in a new language, new songs, just now a worship leader was just singing a new song in the Lord, the song of the Lord, prophetic song, playing instruments, uh, writing songs, blowing trumpets, banners, silence, all right? The Lord is in His temple, silence. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Pastor, number 21, silence is my favorite posture in worship. <laughs> I will silence you, okay? No, no, no. It is a form of worship, but silence cannot be the only form of worship, okay? Even when you sing silent nights, you need to open your mouth, right? <laughs> so in this list, there's no sitting down. In this list, there's no folding arms. In this list, there's no going to toilet during worship. Now, the point is this. And a few weeks ago, Pastor Daniel mentioned this important point in his sermon. It is not about how I feel, no. It is not about, oh, I, oh today I feel great. I want to lift up my hands. Today I feel great. I want to jump. Today I don't feel so great. I'm not going to jump. I'm not. No, no, no. The, the posture, the submission, the determination to worship and praise God is regardless of how we feel. We worship God because He deserves to be worshipped. We worship God because He has first extravagantly loved us. Jesus submitted Himself all the way to the cross for us. So it's not about how I feel, whether I'm bouncing or not bouncing. It is all about Him. Amen? And I, I tell you an important truth. The more you don't feel like it, the more you don't feel like doing devotion, the more you don't feel like lifting your hands, the more you don't feel like it, the more you need to do it. Because it then shows that the heart of worship is true because it goes beyond how we feel. Amen? And very quickly, personal devotion, corporate worship, and love towards others, love for others. And Pastor Wilong brought a great message last week about this. And I'm not going to uh, uh, go into too much details, but the Lord tells us in Matthew 22, verses, uh, verse 39, and it says, a second is equally important, meaning this second part of the great commandment is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Our heart of worship towards God cannot be just within these four walls. It cannot be just within ourselves. It must go out of the four walls because that is, that is part of that true worship that we want to offer to God. Billy Graham says this, the highest form of worship is the worship of unselfish Christian service. The greatest form of praise is the sound of consecrated feet seeking out the lost and helpless. And I really like how one church puts it, obeying the great commandment by fulfilling the great commission. Obeying the great commandment by fulfilling the great commission. And our worship, our heart of worship is never complete until it is expressed outwards towards others. Amen? 
in loving others, we are showing our love for the Lord. Amen. You know, I want to close this time just showing us a video. And some of us, we had the privilege to preview this, this video. And this video, I want to let you know, is created for the celebration of hope. And all of you are going to have a chance to download it, to invite your friend, okay, uh, to the celebration of hope in May, to hear the gospel. And what is really touching about this video is the fact that this person who shared really, really understood what it means to love God, what it means to experience God's love. And, 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 and he saw the love of God towards him even in the most difficult moment of his life. And he was a relatively young believer when, when he came to, to know about loving God. And, and, and just watch this video. And even out of that, that struggle, that, that difficulty that he's currently going through, his heart is expressed in loving God by loving others and wanting to reach out to others. And that is why he made this video. So let's watch this video together before we bring the service to a close. Hi, my name is Raphael Chiu Chow Ming. Why I call myself Raphael? Because Raphael stands for God has healed. In medical terms, I diagnose with muscular atrophy. But in Christ, I'm healed. Actually, in 2006, 7 or 8, during this period of time, I felt myself got no strength. I can't even carry things. Even though I sit on a chair, I got difficulties to get up. Until 2008, my colleague shared gospel with me. I was very touched in my heart. And I told myself, I need to go to church. So when I stepped in the church, I told myself, hey, must be garang, no? gang ho. Chicho Ming, you are strong enough. You cannot cry, you know. Understand? I said, yes. But once they sing the worship song, dancing my soul, while well, my soul start crying, I feel very joyful. La. And I feel I'm renewed. So on that night, 2008, 30th of August, I accepted Christ. And tell Jesus, Jesus, if you are real, tell me what happened to me. So next day, I followed my wife to her church. Happens that I met a pain care specialist. So he checked for me. They said, Chomeng, I think you got muscular atrophy. I said, what is that? He said, Hokkien is muscle kyujui. Your muscle, toing, 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 smaller and smaller. That's it. I said, ha, like that. How are? Uh, he said, never mind, never mind. Uh, look for a second opinion. Uh. So the doctor check. Wow, the doctor check, look at me, check, look at me, check, look at me. Shake his head. I was scared, you know, I said, doctor, what happened? He said, I feel very sad, you know, Mr. Chu. God gave me an anointing to be a doctor, but I don't know why. As a doctor, I cannot heal your sickness because you know, it's a terminal illness. So within 18, 24 months, sayonara. Say, wow, God, take me 40 years to know you. The day I know you, I'm going to see you. I said, cannot lie that day. I want to see another doctor. I look for the Singapore most famous doctor. So before I'm going to see him, I went to a toilet cubicle and I pray. Same thing, I cry and cry and cry and cry and pray and pray. But then God is so good. He you know, I accepted Christ on the 30th of August. But then when I see the third doctor, it was um, 4th or 4th, 3rd or 4th of September. I only read the Bible verse, Psalm 23 and Isaiah 53. Claim that God promised I'll be healed in the name of Jesus, but I'll stop, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. But God gave me the verse about Job. Let me read about Job. Job cannot all this and there, family broke, sickness. He still trusts God. Of course, not God gave me the sickness, but I know that God is with me. I tell myself, it's the total submission. Even though if I die, so what? I'm not really dying. I just go to heaven and join Star Search. And then I start awards. Whatever it is, I say, God, never mind. I trust in you. If I really go upstairs, take care of my wife, my daughter, my mom, that's it. Okay? I join you. Lah. I go upstairs. Lah. So then when I go and see the doctor, the third doctor, suddenly after the, the check-up here and there, touch me and there, say, Chomeng, 
you won't die because of this sickness. You still live maybe another 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, 30 I don't know. But of course, you have to do some adjustment in your lifestyle. Maybe in three years' time, you need a walking stick, five years crunches, seven, eight years, you need to sit, sit on a wheelchair, you cannot move anymore. So thank God, until now, I still can drive, I still can walk, and though I'm very, very slow, but I think God is really good to me. God really prepared me. Before I know my sickness, I know God. So once I know God, I got a peace. Even I encounter storm in my life, but God is with me. Jesus is in the same boat with me. So if Jesus is with me, why should I scared off? Every day when I walk, I do my some daily routine stuff. I might feel some uh, weakness in my leg. I'll just lay my hand and I pray and talk to God. God, give me the strength. I need to walk. I need to do flaming. No, not for my own self. I want to glorify you. And want to, most importantly, I want to share the gospel. If you really want, don't mind. Open up your heart and share with you the gospel. Will give you hope. Not me give you hope. Only Jesus can give you hope. Because of Jesus, everything will turn out good. We invite you to the celebration of hope. 17 to 19 May 2019 at National Stadium. We will see you there. Oh, come on. Let's give Jesus a big, big clap of praise. Hallelujah. Amen. Can I invite us to just close our eyes and, and bow our heads? And, you know, I really, really cannot close this service without giving those of you who have never received Jesus Christ into your heart a chance to receive Him this morning. And perhaps some of you say, Pastor Roland, why must I worship this God, this Jesus, whom you Christians and the church believe in? Well, friends, this is what I can say to you. You can worship Him, you can give your life to Him, because Jesus first gave His life to you. He first reached out to you with extravagant and, and extreme love for you. He's not a God who sits up there and, and He doesn't care about what you're going through in life or the pains or the struggles or the difficulty. He's a God who first came down to show His extreme and extravagant love for you. And friends, listen. What you have watched in the video just now and earlier on in the testimony of Simon just speaks of one thing, that we have a God. We have Jesus who loves us, and Jesus is for you. He's not against you. He cares for you. He loves you. He understands the troubles and the pains and the sicknesses, the brokenness in your marriage, the rebellion of your children. He understands all these things, and He comes to you with His extreme and extravagant love, and He says, I want to help you. And this morning, if you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, God says to you, I am for you. I am not against you. I want to be your friend. I want to come and live in you. I want to come and live in your heart so that my extreme love, my extravagant love can fill your heart. And you know, many of our hearts are just empty. We may be rich, we may be wealthy, we may have success, but our hearts are empty. And some of our hearts are in pain because we are struggling in our marriages, in our finances. We are worried because of sicknesses. Our children are just rebelling against us. Whatever you are going through this morning, Jesus is for you. He is not against you. He wants to be your best friend. He wants to come in and fill your heart with His love, fill your heart with hope and meaning. And this morning, whether you're here at Touch Centre or over there at Suntec, if you have never given your life to Jesus, Jesus loves you and He wants to come and live inside of you. And if you are saying to me, Pastor Roland, then what must I do? Well, this is what you must do and I'm going to help you. I'm going to lead you in a prayer 
And this prayer is designed for those of us who have never invited Jesus Christ to come into our hearts. And as I pray this prayer, you need to pray this prayer together with me, word for word, line by line, whether out loud, whether in your heart, whether you whisper, it doesn't matter. But pray to invite Jesus to come into your heart so that you can receive His extreme and extravagant love in your life this morning. And you do not need to wait another day. Right here, right now, you can receive Him. And as you pray this prayer, all of us here in this family and, our, and your friends who love you so much, who brought you to church, we'll pray together with you. So with all our eyes closed, all our heads bowed over here and even over at Sunset, pray this prayer together with me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord come on, Jesus. 20 times louder. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for your extravagant and extreme love. Thank you for your extravagant and extreme love. I open my heart to you this morning. I open up my heart to you. Thank you that you care for me. Thank you that you care for me. That you are for me and not against me. That you are for me and not against me. I open my heart to you, Lord Jesus. I open up my heart to you, Lord Jesus. And I invite you to come in. And I invite you to come in. Fill my heart with your love, Lord. Fill my heart with your love, Lord. Fill my heart with your grace, Lord. Fill my heart with your grace. Come and help me, Lord. Come and help me, Lord. Through the problems in my life. Through the problems in my life. I invite you to come in. I invite you to come in. I welcome you into my life. I welcome you into my life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. With all our heads bowed, all our eyes closed, nobody looking around. If you prayed that prayer with me for the very first time, this is a very important moment in your life this morning. If you prayed that prayer with me for the very first time, this is what you need to do. I'm going to count one, two, and three. When you hear me say three, I want you to just slip up your hand, lift up your hands without opening your eyes. And, and, and by lifting up your hands, you are saying to me, Pastor Roland, I prayed that prayer with you. I ask Jesus to come into my life this morning. And I, the reason I want you to lift up your hands is so that I can see who you are and I want to bless you and to say a special prayer for you. So with nobody looking around, when I count to three, lift up your hands if you have prayed that prayer with me, even over there at Santec as well. Are you ready now? Don't look around. Nobody looking around because this is a sacred moment at the count of three. One, two, three. Three, lift up your hands and say, Pastor, yes, I see your hand there. Say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer with you. And over there at Suntech as well. Just keep your hands lifted for a couple more seconds. Keep your hands lifted. Yes, just, just lift up your hands. Keep your eyes closed and even up there as well. Keep your hands lifted as I pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. I see your hand there. Father, we want to thank you for our friends who are responding to you this morning over here, even over there at Suntech. We pray, Lord, that your extreme and extravagant love will fill them this morning, that beginning this day, their lives will never be the same again. We thank you, Jesus. We love you. In your name we pray and everybody say, Amen. You may put down your hands. And as you do that, can I invite all of us to stand? And come on, church, as we stand, let's give God a big clap of praise, a big clap of our love and appreciation towards the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Now listen to me carefully. I saw some hands being lifted over there at Scientech as well. This is what's going to happen. We love you. You're very, very important to us. This is what's going to happen. We want to invite you when I count to three once again to bring your belongings and come to the front. The reason we want you to come to the front is because we want to connect with you. And you can ask a friend who has brought you to church this morning to come forward with you. Now listen, even if you did not pray that prayer just now, even if you did not pray it out loud, but you know that you know that you know you need Jesus, you need His love to to fill your life. You need Him to help you through the storms of your life. You come forward uh, the moment I count to three. And listen to me carefully, FCBC. If you brought a friend to church this morning, listen, the moment I count one, two, three, turn to your friend and say, friend, but you want to come, but you want to go, I will walk right down with you. I will join you right here in front so that you, your life can be filled with the love of God. All right? So over here at Touch Center, over there at Sunset, at the count of three, we're going to clap to encourage you because you are so important to us. And let's welcome them church at a count of three. One, two, three. Let's invite them to come. And yes, if you brought a friend to church this morning, just turn to them. And over there at Suntec as well, I can see you through the video screen. You just come forward and say, Jesus, Jesus, I give to you my heart. I give to you my life. We have some more friends coming uh, down the staircase. Let's welcome them. Let's clap for them. 
you know you need to come, just come. Don't wait another day. Today is the moment. Today is the time for you to come. And if you brought a friend to church this morning, just invite them and say, I will come with you. This is the most important day of your life. I made that decision many, many years ago. This morning, you, make, you need to make the same decision. Come on, FCBC. Let's clap as angels in heaven rejoice over many lives that are coming before the Lord right now. Just come. Oh, come on, let's clap for them. Can you just uh, move forward a little bit? Yeah, thank you. Hallelujah. Let's praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And over there, Santa as well. We can see you through the screen. Wow, just, just listen to me for a while. We want to pray for you. We want to bless you. And after we have prayed for you, uh, we want to uh, just follow our pastors a little room outside so that we can spend some time with you. You know, in our church, we would, you will never hear us saying that when you become a Christian, all of your life's problem will go away. It's never the case. It's never the case. But beginning today, you will have a God who loves you so much. He is for you. He's not against you. He extravagantly loves you. His love for you is extreme. And beginning today, you have a God who loves you so much that will walk with you every single day of your life. All right? And all of us here are your family. Let's say hi to them. Okay, and we stretch out our hands towards you. Just close your eyes as we pray for you. And over there at Suntec as well. Father, we love all these friends who have just come forward. We feel like they are children and family coming back to the Father. And we pray for them that, Lord, beginning this day, their lives will never be the same again. Bless their family, bless their health, bless their marriages, bless their work, God, and give them such a wonderful journey ahead in their walk with you. We thank you, Lord, for them. We love them. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say, Amen. Amen. We love you. We thank God for you. Just turn around and follow Pastor Simon. And over there, Santec as well. Just turn around, please. Yeah, and follow Pastor Simon. And as they walk down the aisle, come on, let's, let's thank God for their lives. And if you have friends that want to respond, just follow along and bring them to the consolidation room outside. church God says to us this morning He will never grow tired of saying that He loves us He will never grow tired of being extravagant and extreme in His love for us Lord we want to tell you this morning in return that we want to be extravagant. We want to be extreme in our worship for you, Lord. We want to be just burning so much in our hearts, in our love for Jesus, so that the world out there will say, the God that you worship, the one whom you worship is so different. I want to know Him. I want to receive Him. So Father, this week as we go through life, as we go through our work, as we go through everything that we do in life, we pray that our love and our worship for you will be demonstrated in a way that really, really pleases your heart. We love you, Jesus. You're the most important person in our lives and we love you so much. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody say, Amen. Come on, go ahead and give Jesus a big, big clap of praise. Hallelujah. God bless you as you leave. If you are receiving ministry, just continue to receive. Bring a friend to church next week and we need your help to uh, exit this auditorium so that we can be ready for the next service. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Bring someone to church. Thank you.